Good to go. Okay. All right. Go on. Well, hello. Hello. <laughs> Just to, to start off with, would you like to say uh, your name, where you are? I'm uh, Joe Melnick. I'm in uh, a suburb of Portland, Maine, in the U.S. Okay. So how are you? Just out of curiosity. Uh, I'm good. I'm good. I was in a stuck, stuck place because of the virus for a while. Was, my energy just was dissipating and I've just had a, a, I got recharged about two weeks ago. So I'm, I'm back to my, my old self, I think, in a good oh, way. Good. good. It comes and goes, doesn't it? But... Yeah. How about you? Uh, I'm doing okay. Actually, these interviews really pick me up, so it's uh, it's nice to see you. Um, well, the first question that we have uh, actually pretty much goes right to the point, which is, who are you? Uh, who are you as a human being, as a person? Um, and that might speak to some of your passions, your, your qualities, your values, your interests. Just, who are you? My first response is, I have no idea. I guess I can talk in terms of my values. It's really about, about people and growth and development and you know, all the stuff that's happening in the world right now around social change. And in terms of the Gestalt world, it's expanding our philosophy and our process to get way beyond the individual. That's, that's probably been my life passion. So that's one thing I value a lot. Okay. I like, I mean, I like the answer that I have no idea. That's, that's actually a pretty common response when you get hit over the head with that question. Yeah. I, I'd have to re really think about it. I didn't want to give you a, a biography or a, that's fine. I'm a, I'm a lucky person, I guess. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I've heard good things. That's why we're here. So um, one of the, the other questions that we have um, might help to tease some more of that out is if you would like to maybe share a little bit about a particular event or a circumstance in your life that you feel has helped shape who you are. When I was a uh, junior in high school, I guess I was 15, I fell in love. Hmm. And uh, as I got to know the young woman, one day she said she had to talk to me about something important. And she said, I'm a communist. And I was stunned because I was a naive young man in the suburbs. And her father was communist also, real communist, you know. And uh, they sort of took me under their wing and I went on Pete Seeger rides around New York City and Woody Guthrie and got immersed in the whole uh, social rights movement. He was very much involved with uh, rent control strikes in college and marching on Washington, sort of outside of society. And uh, that still drives me. So the Black Lives Movement has touched me deeply. Uh, and I've always struggled with the notion of do, what do we keep inside the therapy room and what do we keep outside of it? And uh, what's, what's our professionalism that's dictated to us by, uh, in my case, the American Psych Association? And what do I say? Screw it. And, uh, so, you know, a couple of things that are current is at our institute, some people are wanting faculty to take courses on inherent racism that we all carry 
and I'm on the other side because I don't want anybody telling me what to take or not to take. So the, that sort of polarity of caring for other people and not not wanting people to to define who I am and what I can do. So I think uh, my my friend Ed Nevis talked a lot about many many years about how. Uh, what many of us are, what we call marginal people. We hang out at the margins. I imagine you do that also. I know a little bit about you, you know, living in Mexico and the States. And so you, you hang out, you, you pop in and out also, I imagine. I do, yeah, you caught me. <laughs> so we have to pass, yeah. And I can pass and you can pass. And of course, the power of blocks is they, can, not the power, the, the sad thing is they can't pass. That's so powerful that you're going to be stereotyped and caricatured and ain't nothing you can do about it. So that's, I think that's been driving me my entire life and putting it, putting together an issue of, uh, on social change net right now for visual review. We're, we're talking about a lot of this. So I'm excited about that. I also think that's the next place that the Gestalt approach really needs to, to embrace. I think we've done all we can with individual psychotherapy, but everything we've done, the good stuff has been co-opted by everybody else and there really hasn't been very, very much new in the individual therapy realm in many, many years. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of things seem to have become common factors. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. I I, t I tend to want to engage you in a conversation. Well, I, I know do, that's not the point. I do want to answer, but I don't want to take up half of your your screen time. Um, and I'm I'm interested also in in later on setting up some dialogues. Um, where people who actually may be better prepared to get into some of these issues than I am. Can, can have a space to really do that um, without having to bring a presentation, you know, just, just see. And, and a lot of people are answering with similar energy and similar interest around, especially the social change issues. Just like, what else can we do? Yeah. Um, and how? Mm -hmm. So, yes, yes, I, yes, I'm there. Yes, I'm interested. And maybe I won't be quite as there with you right now, but yeah. Um, another question. Okay, that's that's fine. Okay. Another question that I do have is, um, now I'm curious also how that falling in love turned out for you. Um, beyond your mm -hmm. being adopted by the Communist Party. <laughs> uh, she broke my heart. Not, oh, no. for, not for too long. It was okay. puppy love, okay. and uh, and it was good. I mean, it was it was it was good. Okay. In the sense, I think it's good okay. to have your heart broken when you're young. It, it tends to mend faster, I think, sometimes. And and then you know, with the experiences, the worst thing is to have a 50 year old client or patient that was had their heart broken for the first time because they don't know what the territory is. Right. They don't know what the process. I don't know what the mending is. Yeah. So it's it's often, you know, a question I'll ask somebody if they come in, they say, yeah, my my partner dumped me. You know, so is this the first time? And if I say yes, I I feel sad for them. Because I think we're much more flexible and resilient when we're younger. Definitely, definitely. Um, but the the other question that I was going to with that is, so it probably wasn't that particular girl, but I'm curious. Um, what other person or what other human being would you say has had the most impact on you and your being? Hmm. Did you ever know Sonia Nevis? No, I never had the pleasure. Uh, she sort of adopted me when I was about 25 years old. I was just out of graduate school. And she and some other people at, uh, in Cleveland, the Institute, saw something in me and they took me under their wings. 
particularly Sonia, and she was just magical. So she started out as a teacher and a therapist, and then a colleague and a friend, and we traveled together and we written a, a bunch together. So she was a uh, Fritz Perls used to call her, her the original. Because in all the years I knew her, she almost never ever said the same thing twice. So she's one, and then I, I'm married for 52 years. And uh, to my wife, Gloria, and she's absolutely wonderful. And uh, as the famous family therapist, Carl Whitaker said, a good, a good relationship is when somebody gives you as much shit as you give them. And uh, she does. You, you found that perfect balance. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say perfect, but... <laughs> We, we, know, we know how to realign with each other. Right, so there are slides back and forth. Yeah. So about those two, um, those two women, do you want to say anything more about specifically how they've affected you or what comes in your relationship with them? Well, with Sonia, you never knew what was going to come out of her mouth. That was what was always just amazing with her. So whether we were doing a project or just walking along the beach, I was always learning. And that's what made her so powerful. I think she's dead about, been dead for about four years. And uh, so I, I miss her and uh, we were able to create wonderful things together. She loved a good conversation. So we would just talk and talk. I probably have, 50 half finished papers. I'd lose interest or she'd lose interest and we'd go on to the next thing. So there was just tremendous creativity. And my wife Gloria is intellectually probably the brightest person I ever met. Hmm. So uh, sometimes that's a pain in the ass. And sometimes it's just wonderful. So she's always been my editor. Because mm -hmm. she's, a, she's got a doctorate in literature as well as a social work degree. Is Gestalt trained? So I'll come up with a wonderful article. I said, would you look at this? And so say, most of the time she'll say, sure. And they'll come back and this. She'll yeah. hand you back a few pieces. <laughs> Uh, there'll be marks all over and she's always right. Hmm. And she's, she's always amazed how I... How I don't learn to, 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 real, to really write as well as she does. Oh, all the articles come back and you make the same mistake with the next one? Kind of over and over and over again. Of course, she doesn't understand that I don't care that much. Maybe she'll hear that now. <laughs> yeah, well, I, th I think so. But what, one year for a Christmas present, I, I asked her to give me 10 minutes of editing where she wouldn't be critical of me. But she did it. It was wonderful. Oh. Hmm. So she's, she's wonderful to dialogue with also. And, uh, so those, those are yeah, obviously the, the, the two greatest influences up. Mm -hmm. you know, of course, there, there were many others, I mean. I'm sure. And that's, it's kind of, I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, it, it sounds like you are able to sustain deep relationships and for periods of time that are longer than my life to date. Um, and so it sounds kind of superficial to be almost like trying to distill something out of your experiences, but I'm going to keep trying. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, for years, we, we, uh, Sonia, myself, Joseph Zinker, I don't know if you ever met Joseph, uh, Penny Backman and, and Ed Nevis, we, we created our own, own institute. You know, we mm -hmm. left Cleveland and we, we just hung out together and just created things. And we, it was, it was, we were a family. 
and uh, I, I just feel so blessed to have been around these people. It's sort of strange because I'm sort of the only one left. I, I was noticing that as you said it, and I, I wondered how it feels to have to have your colleagues die yeah. and to be the one to continue on with some of that work and some of those projects. Yeah, uh, jo yeah Joseph and Penny aren't dead, but they're long retired. Yeah, I know. Joseph said no to doing a few projects with me. So I know that he's still there and he's still living it up, but he's not, he's not working. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's bizarre being on this end of it because people will tell me something and I'll say, no, that's not the way it was. I was there. I don't say that. I think it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's fascinating how we uh, create our history and our interpretation of things. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's exciting to have been there sort of when, when a lot of this stuff is, has happened. That's why it, we were talking earlier, why I, I love to listen to Irv talk about the beginnings of Gustav therapy. It's mm -hmm. just fascinating. He'll go off on a riff of uh, Isidore Fromm or, uh, or Fritz and Goodman. And so I've sort of become the hist a little bit of a historian and mm -hmm. strange yeah. to be here. Yeah, it's sort of carrying the, the oral history tradition, right? Yeah, that's why I'm, I'm pleased that you're doing this. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to get all these different perspectives and vantage points. Not not one person writing the book, the history of digital therapy. Mm -hmm. That's true, very true. So, how did you start? I mean, if we're going to talk about this as as a historical perspective, I guess, how did you start? How did you get into Gestalt? I was uh, finishing up my doctor degree. Mm -hmm and uh, at the University of Cincinnati. And one of my supervisors was being trained in Cleveland. And he'd come back, they'd go away, you know, four days at a time. And, he, and his eyes were just lit up. And he kept telling me about these wonderful experiences. And uh, sort of sort of being, a, wanting to be a, a little bit of an academic, but never really liking individual therapy. I, I, uh, I was fascinated with group therapy. Mm -hmm. So I went up to Cleveland as a graduation present for, th for three days for you know, an introductory workshop. And uh, the one who was leading it was a woman named Maury Creelman. And she was the first person who, so I'm going to give you some history now. She, she was the first person who encountered Fritz in New York and brought him up to Cleveland to train people. And Maury, uh, She's long dead. I think even when she was 35, she looked to me about 70 or 80. And she just sat there the whole weekend. And I, and I was, you know, all of my arrogance. And I said, I can do a great job. I can do much better than that. What is this bullshit? And then all of a sudden, the, the last morning, she started working. And she must have worked with 10 people like in two hours. And my eyes just lit up. And I, I said, whatever that is, I, I, I want to know about it. So the, so I got, I got hooked pretty early. And it's always had what I wanted. I never felt a need to go outside Gestalt therapy. I want to integrate it with other approaches. It, it really, it feels like home to me. And, and what is what is that particular flavor? What is, what is Gestalt for you? What is it that makes you say, that's enough, I want to stay here? It's the creativity. It's the, it's the inside and the outside. It's the uh, paying attention to process. I think it's the creativity most that if you, if you stay soft, we use the expression soft eyes, wonderful things emerge that are different. It's the optimism, it's the possibilities. It's uh, thinking in the, in the, you know, not in a, in a naive way, but thinking about the goodness in people. And that's, you know, that's been challenged a little by Trump. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to 
come up with anything. I, I, I guess I, I'm not sure if I keep trying. That might be a lie. I don't think I try anymore. To, to find that, a saving grace? Excuse me? To find a saving grace in, in that particular individual? Or what do you Yeah, mean? I mean, I, I, I like to. I, I just got off the phone with a Zoom call with a, with a patient who's, who's a Trumpy. And he's open to hearing what I don't like about Trump. And he says, he said to me, I want you to tell me something good about Trump. And of course I was, I, I loved him asking that question. And I love the conversation. And uh, other than something trite, it's hard for me to come up with anything. Mm -hmm. So I think that's sort of where my interest is right now. I think as an approach was so dialogical and we don't deal with people who we call characterologically disturbed, who are, right. who are just messed up. And I think that's the a problem in our in our business. But we do have an optimis optimism and dialogue. But what happens when there are just bad people in the world? I haven't figured out how to deal with that. Well, it sounds kind of like the the colorblindness ideology that I, I was raised with in Canada in the 80s and 90s. It's just like pretending that if you don't see it, it's not there, but difference is real. And we lose the ability to differentiate. We lose criteria, we lose a sense of orientation. If yeah. we pretend that we can apply anything across the board, even with every human being. Yeah, yeah, it's the, it's, it's the downside of, of our optimistic belief system, you know. Well, you know, people write about this all the time. Yeah, you know, sometimes awareness ain't enough. True. Yeah. True. So you say that's challenging, and I'm, I'm curious where else you found yourself challenged. Um, staying in Gestalt, holding Gestalt, building an institute around Gestalt. What, what have been the challenges? What have been some of the things that you've had to to push back against or overcome in your in your career in your process. Not much. <laughs> I, I, you found I, the right I, people. Then. Hmm? You found the right people. Yeah, I've always had tremendous support. Uh, whenever I wanted to do something, when I, when I wanted to start the the short review, you know, the journal I started years ago. Mm -hmm. People said, okay, how can we help you? you? Need some money, we'll get you some money. You need some support, we'll get you some support. You need to talk to people. And I think that was one of the powers of our institute. If you want to do something and it makes sense, we'll support you. And that's, so that, I'm, I'm not sure that goes throughout the, the digital world, but that's been so, so, certainly part of our institute. And, uh, so there, there are really haven't been that many blocks. Hmm. In many ways, when people get off, um, even people who I disagree with philosophically, and there's many of those, typically when I would get in the room, I say, oh, you're, you're part of my, my community. I won't say family, I don't like that word. But we're all some of the same community. I think there's some really underlying values uh, that, we, that we all have in common and uh, that, that, that's been a blessing uh, I mean uh, there's a whole generation uh, my generation uh, that got to know each other through, through small conferences and everything and some of those relationships are still there and that, that's been wonderful so there's a whole bunch of us who grew up together in the Gestalt world and were nurtured and mentored. And, and that's one of the wonderful things. I've got friends everywhere and colleagues. It's true. I mean, I, I ask people sometimes about what their experience of, of a Gestalt community is. And, and some people can only answer within an institutional context. And they think that an institute or a brand is that experience that you just described, but it's not. It's that, I mean, I've met you through AAGT, which is, I mean, it's, it's called a community. 
And I, I've noticed that it's a very different experience for the generation that was part of creating it than those of us who are coming into it as something that already went through its own growth process. It's not, it's not that we can't get in. It's not that I can't get in. I'll speak for myself. But it, it's, it's a very different, it's almost a felt sense of not having been there as this came out. So it's, it's a little difficult sometimes finding, a, finding an experiment that hasn't already been tried and <laughs> done better than, and, and finding a chance to, to get a voice in there. There's, there is support, but there's just so much lived experience already accumulated. Sometimes it's, it's difficult. Sure. Yeah. Well, it's like forming any, you know, joining any group. Mm -hmm. the, we've got this cohesive group that people have been fighting and struggling as well as loving each other. Yes. It's really, really hard. It's, it's hard to get in. Well, I mean, the, the, even the rules for the fights are already established. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been in AAGT pretty much from the beginning, but never really felt like that was my community. Okay. And what is your community then? What are you referring to? I, I think it's my institute. Okay. And, uh, and different people around the world. Uh, we had, uh, we used to have lots and lots of small conferences, leadership conferences and roots conferences where people would just come together and spend four or five days together. And it was lovely. Many of us most still do teach at other institutes, and that, that that's always great. So, so. I, I think the theoretical differences which drive a lot of the lists of conversations, for example, disappear when people are just face to face. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things I like about the Gestalt world. It's, it's welcoming, it's generous. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about some of the things I don't like. But, you know, those are some of the things I do like. Mm -hmm. and, and what would be, I mean, historically speaking, <laughs> you know, the, the, the storytelling kind of opportunity here is, is amazing. Um, so I'm wondering, like out of those different experiments that you've done, the things you've tried, the things you've built, what would you say are some of the highlights for you? Like what, what are some of your greatest moments, your, your things that you go, I think this was a peak. When I started Gestalt Review, uh, part of my goal was to bring people together. So if you'd go way back to uh, 1998, and you looked at the editorial board, you'd see they were from all over the world from different orientations. And then out of that, uh, about five of us put together an idea called the Leadership Conference, in which we would invite leaders of Gestalt Institutes, writers, to come together. And uh, we had our first one in Denmark. I don't, don't remember when. And uh, we had no idea whether anybody would come and it was oversubscribed, and people just loved it. And uh, we had a, a wonderful band and presentations. And we did that uh, uh, every other year for a whole bunch of years. I think we finally ran out of steam about five, six years ago. So I'm, re I'm really proud of that. Those, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with all the people who were involved with those things. And you find out just wonderful things about each other. You know, somebody who sort of a very rigid person, all of a sudden they, they started singing in front of a band and they were wonderful. You know, all, all the surprises, because we tend to caricature people or stereotype people. So those, 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 those two things stand out. Mm -hmm. And how would you say I, I mean, I don't know. I haven't heard much about what you do outside of Gestalt. Like, I don't know if you're, I don't know, a secret baseball fan or something, but is there another aspect of your life that Gestalt is not really involved in? Hmm. I'd say, 
I'd, I'd say no, it's, it's a philosophy for living in the world, how to be with people, how to treat people. And it underlines, when my, when my daughter uh, graduated college, uh, Ed Nevis and I were uh, running a five-day workshop in Cleveland. We were just playing around with the, 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 the concept of strategic and intimate. I don't know if you're familiar with those concepts. We were developing the theory and we were doing a five-day workshop in Cleveland. And I invited my daughter to come up and participate. And she did. And so, so I said, Alicia, what do you think about it? And she said, I, I knew this all the time. And she's not an arrogant person. It's that the, the philosophy just goes through our veins. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it informs me. Of course, I have lots of other things I love doing, you know, besides you know, my professional work, but it's, it's the underlying philosophy. It's, it's what I love about it. It's the philosophy of process, of optimism. It's like when I landed here, I've, I've just never had the, the motivation to try to bring in something else or uh, I'm, I'm still naively stunned when people leave the Gestalt world for something else. And they, somehow they found our philosophy or our way of being is wanting. And yeah, that's, that's surprising for me because I mean, I, in, in some ways I feel like I have some kind of like attention deficit and I haven't been distracted from Gestalt and I haven't wanted to go away and find something else and felt done with it yeah and I'm I'm still I'm finding people who have spent their entire lives into their 80s 90s still finding more and I think well I have all of this ahead of me there's no way I can get bored with this oh yeah I don't think I'm gonna run out of material once you once you get hooked like some of us get hooked on it it's uh, it's always developing. I'm, I'm always learning, like I said, all those half-finished papers that I've lost interest in because I've learned something and then I put them away. Mm -hmm. I, I also have, I think, hundreds of videotapes that I inherited from Cleveland years ago. Ooh. You know, eight millimeter one, you know, mm -hmm. the projector stuff. And so, you know, at this point in my life, I'm I'm trying to figure out what to do with it. Maybe I could hook you into taking them over or something. But some of them are fascinating. The Joe, Melna, Joe Melnick archival collection. <laughs> we had we had one with Isidore Frome. We, I think we were, the, we were the we were the only time we ever got him on visit, videotape. Hmm. So we we talked him into doing that. So I think there's I think there's a lot to be explored. I think there really is. I mean, I've always been fascinated to to see what Ansel had in those Kent archives and oh, where yeah. they've gone quickly now and just I mean it's not the same having somebody tell you what they took away from it as actually being able to sit down and watch watch something happen in real time. Oh, yeah yeah I, I have one of Carl Whitaker do you know who he is? No I haven't heard that name. He's one of the great names in family therapy. Okay. And uh I think it was done in the 1950s. I sort of inherited him. He's there with 1950s clothing and everything, but it, I, I don't know how many times I've, I've, I've watched, watched it and listened to it. It's just fascinating. So again, I'm, I, guess, I guess as we're talking, I, I, I'd love to, some of the stuff to sort of get out into the world more. I think there's definitely a need for that because I don't think that people can talk about Gestalt dying or being in, you know, danger of extinction in different parts of the world before it's even been seen, before it's even been really known. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, I think it is dying in its, some of its original form because the times have changed. Right, but there's, yeah. I think there is some more nourishment in there still. It's not about creating more and more new stuff. I think that there is a lot that hasn't been processed. Yeah, it's, it's happening now. You know, there's a lot of organizations uh, dealing with organizational gestalt therapy. You know, there are groups that are doing it. 
you know, groups dealing with social change. Mm -hmm. I and mean, that's, what, that's where my excitement is. Now that's actually, that is one of the other questions that I had is specifically, um, what are you working on sort of in that now to next kind of area? Where would you like to go or where would you like to see other people go with Gestalt? I mean, it's almost ridiculous asking that to someone who has managed so many projects on an institutional level and all of the projects that have come through. But what are the ones that particularly get your attention now? One we're struggling with right now in terms of our institute is that we're a very lily white institute and we failed many, many times to uh, have our, our center be more diverse. And I think that's, that's true with pretty much the, most of the Gestalt world. And uh, I've tried many, many things and failed and we're right on that edge right now trying to figure out how, how can we uh, bring in more diversity. So, uh, so that, 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 that's a major project. And then uh, I go back and forth whether I want to write another book or not. I have the fantasy and then sometimes I don't have the energy and sometimes I'd much rather walk along the ocean side. So. If I was given a choice, I don't think I'd be writing a book if I could walk along the ocean right now. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm lucky. The, the ocean is just a little bit down there. Mm -hmm. You can walk there in about two minutes. Hmm. Have you ever been to Maine? I haven't. I was going to go up for the research conference and I didn't make it, the second one. Oh, that was at our institute, yeah. It was. I missed it. In Cape Cod, yeah. Mm -hmm. Huh. We'll have to come to our institute sometime. I, I'm definitely interested. I think I, I took a workshop with you once in California. Um, it was on organizational, basic organizational gestalt principles. Uh, oh, really? Were, I think, see. Uh, yeah. And um, that's all I knew about you. I, I knew I'd seen your name on countless documents, uh, flyers, books, reviews, the magazine, the journal, all of that kind of stuff. But I, I had never had a chance to sit down and, and have a conversation with you. And it, it's interesting because I'm feeling like this is probably actually one of the poorest interviews I've been able to hold. Really? Just in the sense that I, I feel like I'm trying to, with all due respect, like trying to eat an elephant and I'm really not sure if I can get enough substance in any kind of bite that I'm able to take on oh. with, a, with a question or a, a getting in there. Huh. And I don't, I don't know what it, what it would be like for you right now to have me say that that's how I'm feeling with you, but maybe we should work on that in therapy. <laughs> Well, when you were asking me earlier, what what do I love about Gestalt or where's my interest? A lot of it, uh, when we were in Cleveland way at the beginning, before we split, we were part of three centers and we were called the center, I think for intimacy. So I've spent my much of my professional career uh, trying to figure out how to have an intimate conversation. And so my tendency is to, is to want to hear more from you. Yeah, I'm noticing myself being drawn out. So you're very good at that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, much better at it than I am. And, and to use the brain, you, you're very good at resisting. <laughs> I told you I was going to try and hide, but it's not working. Yeah. Well, my, my colleague Penny Backman said something so simplistic and profound. Many years ago, we were teaching. She said, an intimate conversation has to go back and, back and forth three times. It can't be question and answer. So yep. when we train people at our institute, we train them how to teach mm -hmm. and how to create intimacy in the teaching and the connection. Right. And that's one of the things I, I, I love about our center because uh, we're very much into creating that connection. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, so I have been trying to pull you in a little bit more. Well, and it, it's the co-created dialogical learning experience, isn't it? That's, yeah. that's very much what works for me and it's very much how I work myself. Yeah. So. Yeah. I was, it's interesting, I was no longer interested in my own experiment of, of the, uh, the interview format once we started speaking. Yeah, interviews are, they're, I'm, I was gonna say, I think they're tough. Uh, I've been reviewing, uh, well, if I'm interviewing you, there's, you know, the, the hierarchy and the unbounce. I mean, we can get, get into the whole thing about that. Yeah. You know, if, if you were Sonia, I would have said, oh, gee, that sounds like it's a good beginning of a paper. Right. And we'd start talking about, you know, the difference in hierarchy between interviewing somebody and, and be, being, you know, connected this way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about this and I'm wondering if, if we're going to publish this one or not. Maybe we'll stop it a few <laughs> a little bit back. But I'm, I would be interested for sure in being a part of a conversation with you and some other people who you have more of that common ground with. I feel like it might get off the ground a little bit faster. And it's not, it's not about feeling less or it's not about feeling behind or under you in any way. I'm very cocky that way. I don't have that problem usually. I don't notice when I should be a little lower down. But I, I'm just interested in, in seeing what would happen when you're with the people who you're used to being with and who you have a lot more to talk about with. I don't know if that would be interesting for you. Oh. Yeah. I could have, you know, would you have liked more content for me? I don't know. Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't have any necessarily expectations. Some people feel very nostalgic in storytelling and narrative. Um, yeah. And some people feel very I'll take this as an existential therapy question and just answer in the moment and see where they go. Um, I mean, there's been different responses and, and some people have, you know, wonderful, grandiose, narcissistic responses and yeah. have way more of themselves than will fit on the, the hour, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as you're talking, I'm, I, I, I know I'm interested in you and I want to know more about you. I mean, that's what... <laughs> That, that's what, uh, when we talk about, uh, you know, a, a tiny piece of content, uh, it's about interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, when relationships diminish or fade away, it's often a lack of interest. And I think uh, seasoned therapists uh, have the ability to be interested or to you use uh, herbs terms to really be fascinated by other people and curious and if you've ever had therapy by somebody who's really interested in you it's, it's such a fabulous experience i just got off of a zoom call like i said with a client who was talking about the fact that his parents were never interested in him he said he said to me do you know what that's like i, said, I have no idea but it must be horrible I mean, how could a parent not be interested in a child? Isn't that amazing? Of course, we know that's true. It is, and it's one of the saddest situations I can imagine. I don't know how you ever recover from that. No, and I don't, I don't know how you get there as a parent. I mean, I don't know how they can, my kids can drive me crazy, but I don't know how to not find them interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, with this with this person who I'm very interested in, he pushes my interest away. He doesn't believe it. He questions it. He isn't sure if it's real. Hmm. But he hangs in there with me, and I hang in there with him. Hmm. He just written me an angry email about uh, about the masks 
because he's, he's a scientist, and he said, there's no evidence to show that these masks, you know, and he, and he, he listed his references. Right. And I wrote him, I, I emailed him back. And at the end, at the end of his email, he'd apologized for sort of vomiting it out. And I told him how much I liked him receiving his email, and that we should do this more often. And he was surprised, I think pl pleasantly surprised, because I said I was interested in him. And it came across in a different form. So, I mean, that small, that small moment was, you know, touched me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I do, I do want to dialogue with you. So it, it reminds me of a, a client of mine who is a severely depressed young 20s man. And he, he was amazed, and he said it in so many words, that he was amazed that I was even able to stomach him and that I could sit with him when that's all he was, was just basically a, a walking ball of depression was how he described himself. And, you know, that was his being and that that was interesting for me was very surprising for him. And he had not had that experience. He felt he had to do something else to be more interesting. When we're talking, I think of the power of our work. And I know other theories would have similar concepts, but it's part of the essence of what, of what we do. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's interesting. I, I'm noticing that the way your camera is uh, framing you, you have become almost like a Monet sort of impressionist painting. Oh yeah, I can see. Yeah, there's a fireplace in the back. Yeah, yeah it's the, it, between the bricks and the mosaic in the, uh, the glass thing behind you. It's, it's taken all of the light and it's fragmented it. So you, you've become oh, I planned a, this, you know that. I've been working on this. Yeah, you've been setting this up, I'm sure. It's a filter that you've downloaded and everything, right? But <laughs> it's, um, it's interesting. So I've now been having a dialogue uh, with a Monet painting. And uh, <laughs> in the old days, we'd one say, of those things that I could not have seen coming, you know? <laughs> in the old days, we'd say, so that now be the, the Monet painting, or how are you like that? Or... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, I, I could go somewhere with that, but then I think I have to start paying you by the hour, so. <laughs> or at least buying the painting, yeah. Right. Maybe I'll just frame this and, uh, and keep it there. So I, I'm curious, would you be interested in, in having a, a dialogue session further down the line, maybe with a few other people, having some conversations? Well, that might be fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd love that. I, yeah, i say it. I do it all the time. I imagine that. I kind of figured I would just sort of set a, a meeting and uh, and hit the button. But uh, you know, when, at our at our at our center, it's it's not always a hundred percent of the time. But we rarely ever teach by ourselves. It's almost always team teaching. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever presents by themselves necessarily without talking about what they're going to do. So that sort of connectedness, the relational aspect is really ingrained. Yeah. So yeah, that's... That feels, feels very much like what works for me. Um, so I'm wondering if there's anything that you want to add to, to this little moment. Um, I'm so happy you're doing this with people. I mean, that, 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 that's what I want to add. Because you're doing something that I, that I aspired to do. And uh, I think the Gestalt world was a very much a hierarchical, top-down world. And the way you rose in the world was you became part of a teaching faculty, you published, you did this. So the fact that the Gestalt world is being shaken up, that people are starting online journals, that people are putting on different conferences, I, 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 I think it's just wonderful that the hierarchy is being softened and diminished. You know, you, you don't have to be to put in 25 years before people notice you. So I, 
I'm, 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 I'm so pleased you're doing this. Well, thank you. And, and what you just said, I mean, it's part of that generosity that it's, that there are definitely people who are willing to support and to help new people come in. It's not all competition and knock you down and there, there is a lot of support. So I, I appreciate what you're saying and that it's possible. So it sounds like we're getting ready to stop, but let me ask you a question. Uh oh. <laughs> Personal question. Do you have a DVD player? Uh, I do, yes. Okay. Uh, if you send me an, your address, I'll send you some DVDs of uh, some of the ones I was talking about. Oh, that sounds exciting. So you, you can get, we, we have them. Um, uh, we put them together years ago. We've got about five or six of them with some of the really well-known people, you know, the Isidore Frohm and the Carl Whitaker and Sonia and Edwin, and you might enjoy them. I think I definitely would. I fully admit that I would rather watch that than a lot of the stuff on Netflix. So, <laughs> yes, thank you. I appreciate that. So if you're good, I guess we'll uh, stop here and say thank you for now. Okay, nice having this conversation. Okay.